Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Olympus OMD EM1X, a high end mirrorless camera aimed at sports and wildlife pros who demand speed and durability. It shares the 20 megapixel 4 3rd sensor, 4K video, and burst shooting of the EM1 Mark II, but is larger and pitched at a higher level with an integrated battery grip, tougher credentials, improved autofocusing, even better stabilization than before, and a higher price tag too of $2,999 or 2,799 UK pounds. You could describe it as a beefed up EM1 Mark II, but it's not designed as a replacement. It's not an upgrade for that model. Instead, it debuts a new line in the OMD range. In my review, I'll show you everything you need to know. And if you find these videos useful, please do like and subscribe as it really helps my channel grow. Thanks. The EM1X sensor is now over two years old and unbelievably it's only the second camera to use it. I really wish Olympus had deployed it in an EM5 successor before this but there you go. And to be fair if you're into shooting action with the Micro Four Thirds system it remains the best option as it's the only one with embedded phase detect autofocus. So in terms of photo and video quality and AF hardware behind the scenes it's essentially the same as the EM1 Mark II but Olympus has improved the focusing algorithm as well as the built-in stabilization, now claiming up to seven stops of compensation with unstabilized lenses, or seven and a half with SYNC IS models like the 12 to 100 mm To put it to the test for stills, I took it around Brighton at dusk, deliberately fixing the sensitivity to a low value and letting the stabilization deal with the slow shutter speeds. I used the 17mm f1.8, which, with a 34mm equivalent field of view, would normally require a shutter speed of at least a 30th of a second to avoid shake without stabilization. With stabilization enabled, though, the EM1X let me easily handhold beyond one second. In fact, the slowest shutter I managed to handhold that evening was eight seconds, and that was without leaning against anything or particularly bracing myself. Now that's an incredible eight stops of compensation over traditional wisdom, even with my coffee related wobbles. And that's one of the benefits of having a smaller sensor, the chance to deliver amazing stabilization, which in turn allows you to deploy lower ISO sensitivities for decent quality and leave the tripod at home for all but the longest exposures. Nobody does this as well as Olympus and it's also fantastic for video as I'll show you later. Olympus makes bold claims about weather sealing and the EM1X is no different. In fact, it's the first interchangeable lens camera I've tested with an official IPX1 rating. That means it should survive dripping water from above for about 10 minutes. Well, I've had the EM1X and the 40 to 150, obviously make sure it's a weather sealed lens kits, outside in the British rain for about 15 minutes and it's pretty soaked. But I reckon we can do better than that. So uh, here we go with about one litre of water over the top. I'm very nervous about this. I've never done this before. I do have permission from Olympus to do this. Right, so that has a fair amount of uh, water directly from above. Now let's see if the camera works. Okay, here goes. Well, it's come on. Yep. That's absolutely fine. So, I'm pretty confident in saying that the EM1X will work when it's had a good soaking. With its integrated battery portrait grip, the EM1X reminds you of the Canon EOS 1DX Mark II or Nikon D5. But while the EM1X comfortably becomes the largest, heaviest and most expensive camera in the Micro Four Thirds system to date, it's still roughly half the price of the Pro Canon and Nikon DSLRs, not to mention a little smaller and up to a third lighter too. On the top surface of the camera, we've got dedicated buttons on the left side for accessing the autofocus, drive mode, and bracketing settings, and around these, a satisfyingly chunky power switch. Just listen to that. That, everybody, is how you do a power switch on a camera. To the right of the viewfinder head, the main mode dial, and to seasoned Olympus owners, you'll notice that there is no longer a dedicated position for the art filters or an automatic mode. After all, this is a high-end professional camera. It still has the art filters, you just access them through the menus. And those two free positions are now occupied by a fourth custom mode and a dedicated position for the bulb mode if you're into doing long exposures. 
Around the shutter release button, we've got dedicated exposure compensation, ISO sensitivity, and movie record buttons. And again, seasoned Olympus owners will notice that the control dials are no longer on the top surface, but they're actually embedded within the body. We've got a front control wheel, and one for your thumb on the rear, and they do feel fantastic. Olympus has embedded them within the body here for better weatherproofing. But it does free up rather a lot of real estate on this top surface, doesn't it? This is surely crying out for a top LCD or OLED display of some description. Maybe it wasn't included to avoid making the camera any thicker, but I'm sure they could have fitted something in here. As it stands, you have a large surface that you could maybe rest your thumb on or perhaps a tiny drink or sandwich. Turning to the back of the camera, you can see that Olympus has used the extra release state of this body to pack on lots of controls, lots of dedicated controls. We've got a white balance button here at the bottom. We have for the first time, surprisingly, on an OMD, an AF joystick. Believe it or not, this was not present on the EM1 Mark II. I always have to remind myself of that. And you can, of course, use it to move the AF area if you don't want to use it, uh, move it by touch. You can also move it diagonally, which is uh, really nice quite unusual actually and we have uh, portrait controls here so we have two AF joysticks this one down here is for when using the camera in the portrait orientation and you also have the same control wheels shutter release everything is exactly where you would expect it whether you're using this camera horizontally or vertically and we also have the 2x2 two two control switch here which lets you double up the uh, configuration of your front and rear control dials the EM1X is equipped with an electronic viewfinder with a large 0.83 times magnification, bigger than most, although matched by the Lumix G9. But while most high-end mirrorless cameras these days already employ 3.68 million dot panels, with 5.76 million dot viewfinders already making an appearance, Olympus has opted for a relatively low resolution 2.36 million dot panel, making its viewfinder image look coarser than most rivals. You can most obviously see this around the edges of fonts, although it also means very fine details in the frame may look slightly fuzzier than rival viewfinders. Additionally, Olympus has stuck with LCD technology for its viewfinder, which, like the EM1 models before it, delivers a lower contrast image compared to the high contrast OLED panels of pretty much everyone else. Olympus chose LCD based on refresh rate and the fact it believes the softer image is better suited to skin tones. Now, as a landscape shooter, I personally prefer the punchier OLED panels, and I haven't experienced issues with refreshing on those either, but I certainly don't mind the LCD panel on the EM1X, although I do wish it had been high resolution, especially for the body price. I should also add, in both of the continuous low drive modes, whether using the mechanical or electronic shutter, there's some viewfinder blackout between frames, although it is possible to follow subjects fairly effectively while shooting. You may also notice the viewfinder resolution drop temporarily while focusing. Like the EM1 Mark II before it, the EM1X is fitted with a side hinged screen that flips out to face forward. Fantastic if you're into vlogging or selfies. I'm not sure how many EM1X owners are going to be doing self portraits, but they can. You can also flip it back on itself for protection. I really like side hinge screens because when I've got it at about this angle, it means that I can shoot in the portrait orientation, of course, with the extra comfort of this system and still shoot at nice high or low angles and be able to uh, preview that. Of course, it's not as quick or as discreet. It's a screen that just tilts vertically. But, you know, I'm really pleased that Olympus went for this option because this is my preferred screen mechanism. Olympus always makes good use of its touch screen. You can, of course, tap to reposition the AF area or tap to pull focus in movies. I'll show you that later on. You can press OK to bring up the super control panel, which gives you instant access to a lot of settings, and you can tap your way through this as well. And in playback, you can swipe through images. You can't pinch to enlarge, but if you do tap the screen, you can get a slider on the right hand side and you can scroll around by touch there. Olympus was one of the first camera companies to really address battery life on mirrorless cameras, developing a nice big new chunky pack for the previous EM1 Mark II. And now the EM1X actually houses two of those same batteries 
in a tray that slides out from the portrait section of the body. This, of course, roughly doubles the battery life compared to the EM1 Mark II. Each one of these batteries is good for, let's say, about 400 shots under super conditions. But if you're shooting mostly continuously in a burst sequence, if you're shooting sports or wildlife, you're mostly using the viewfinder, you're not playing back many of those images at a time, then you can really get massive battery life out of this. I was typically getting well over a thousand shots per battery when I was shooting action, sports or wildlife with this camera. In terms of video, I managed to film just over 10 half hour 4K clips in a row. That's 307 minutes in total with no overheating. And I also managed to film half an hour of 4K under USB power alone for my MacBook Pro supply, so long as there is a few minutes of charging the batteries first. Oh, one more thing. When battery one is running low, you'll see the icon flash red, even if battery two is fully charged and ready to go. It's really distracting, especially if you're filming and don't know if you have enough power to finish the clip. It'd be much better if the EM1X either displayed the life of both batteries as separate icons like Fujifilm does, or added them together into a running total. I'd really like this to be fixed with a firmware update, please Olympus. Like most high-end mirrorless cameras, please take note, Canon and Nikon, the EM1X is of course equipped with twin memory card slots. In this instance, they are both SD memory cards. And thank you very much, Olympus. They will both exploit the speed of UHS Class II cards. This is in some contrast to the previous EM1 Mark II, where only one of those slots would exploit UHS II speeds. And I should also point out that Sony's A9, for all of the great things that that camera offers, only one of its card slots will exploit the speed of UHS Class 2. So thank you very much for that Olympus. And also take a moment here to notice the rubber sealing around here. The weatherproofing on this camera really is to a very high standard. There's a bunch of ports on the left hand side of the body behind three rubber flaps. On the lower flap we've got the HDMI port and a USB-C port here which can be used for data transfer, for tethering of course. But you can also now charge batteries in camera over USB, something that was not possible on the EM1 Mark II so I'm pleased to see that. You can also charge both batteries simultaneously and you can also do USB power delivery so you can actually power the camera over a USB source as well which is really nice because not many cameras do that. Above this, we have got a headphone output. And above that, if I can just get to it, is the microphone input. And you'll notice that the microphone input is considerately above the hinge of the screen. So if you do have a microphone connected to that, you should be able to open up that screen without obstructing it. Thank you very much, Olympus. If you buy the EM1X, it's safe to say that you're gonna be using it for some burst shooting, some action and sports photography. So it's very important to understand the various icons that Olympus uses to distinguish between the different drive modes, because it is a little bit confusing. If there is a little love heart in the corner of the icon, that means it's using the silent or electronic shutter. If it doesn't have the love heart, it's using the mechanical shutter. So first of all, we have the two single drive modes, mechanical and electronic. Then when we go onto the continuous drive modes, we've got high speed and low speed. Now in Olympus's world, high speed uses single AF and is faster, but single autofocus. Low speed is obviously slower, but uses continuous autofocus. And each of these is available in three different versions. There is a version with the mechanical shutter, a version with the electronic shutter, and a version with Pro Capture, which is the mode that pre-buffers some frames while you have your finger half pressed on the shutter, and then when you push it all the way down, it commits those to memory. So there are your three high speed modes, remember, those with single autofocus, and now your three low speed modes, remember, with continuous autofocus. Below this, we've got the self timers, and then below this, we've got the high res mode. So learn those icons because you really need to understand which is which to make the most out of this camera. Here's a sequence I shot with Pro Capture, fully pushing the shutter down as the bird took off. Thanks to the pre buffering while I half pressed, though, the EM1X captured a bunch of frames prior to takeoff, ensuring I didn't miss the moment. It's absolutely brilliant for this kind of photography, like birds that are perched, waiting to go. You will always get that moment as soon as they take off and the wings look fantastic. Panasonic has something similar but at 4 or 6K video resolution and in JPEG only, whereas Olympus captures at the full 20 megapixel resolution in JPEG or RAW and it can also autofocus during the burst, at least in the low mode. You won't find this capability on any Canon, Nikon or Sony body at the time I made this video. 
With the same sensor as the EM1 Mark II, the EM1X also shares its embedded phase detect autofocus array. This uses an 11 by 11, 121 point array. You can see all of them here and the coverage on the frame. Now, one of the things that makes this unique compared to other phase detect embedded autofocus systems is other manufacturers don't actually say whether they are single type, cross type, they don't really give any details, which makes you think that they're actually only sensitive in one axis, whereas Olympus implicitly or explicitly says that they are all cross-type sensors. And we can use the control dials to reduce this to make very zoned areas, and you can move them around. This is a really good uh, cross uh, pattern for following action. And we've got two different sizes if you want a single point. The AF array may be inherited from the EM1 Mark II, but it's now powered by dual processors running completely redeveloped algorithms. I'm using continuous AF with tracking here and with face and eye detection enabled, which now uses the phase detect system as it should. It's still not as sticky as the latest Sony's, but manages to stay with me most of the time. You can choose face with or without eye detection from the menus and I'd recommend enabling it when shooting people but turning it off when you're not as it can sometimes mistake other objects for faces and prioritise them instead. Beyond human faces you can now tell the EM1X to track three other types of specific subjects, cars and bikes, aeroplanes and helicopters or trains and in each case Olympus has trained the system to not only recognise and follow them with an AF box but also prioritise details when they get close enough like a driver's face or the front cabin of a long train. You can see it working here with a radio controlled car and once the system recognises the subject it'll surround it with a flexible frame and focus on that. I didn't just shoot toy cars though, I took the EM1X to Donington to shoot proper racing cars on a racetrack and all the photos I'll show you were taken with the 300mm F4 lens for a 600mm equivalent field of view. I used the car tracking mode for most of my shots and found the camera successfully locked onto vehicles as soon as they entered the frame, surrounding and following them with a flexible rectangular box. It looks and works like face detection in this regard, only with cars or other vehicles. I do wonder if all this intelligence could just be wrapped up into a single object tracking mode though. Why do I have to choose whether it's looking for cars or aeroplanes? That said, the hardware kept up, refocusing the lens confidently in either of the continuous low modes, shooting up to 10 frames per second with a mechanical shutter, or up to 18 frames per second with electronic shutter. If I pan quickly with the electronic shutter, there was unsurprisingly some skewing, but it's not as noticeable as some cameras I've tested, like the Fujifilm X-T3. Vehicle tracking's all very well, but what if you're a wildlife shooter? I headed down to Brian Seafront to capture the local seagull population. In the absence of any specific bird or animal recognition modes, I just used the normal continuous AF with tracking option for these photos and the 40 to 150mm at 150mm f2.8 for 300mm equivalent field of view. Generally speaking, the tracking would begin to follow the bird as it approached, but occasionally jumped away, forcing me to restart the tracking again. Don't get me wrong, it still worked better than many cameras I've tested and delivered a decent hit rate, but again, it lacks the ultimate confidence of the recent Sony cameras I've tested. I then tried the EM1X for cycling, placing the target over Alexander as he cycled towards me. This sequence was shot with a 40 to 150 at 150mm f2.8 for a 300mm equivalent field of view, and I used the electronic shutter mode here, which captured 17 to 18 frames per second in practice. Like most cameras, the challenge is accurately selecting the subject when it's small and distant, but as it becomes larger on the frame, it's easy to specify and remain locked on. I enjoyed using continuous AF with tracking to recompose the shot without worrying whether the bite was under the correct AF area or not. Shooting menu 2 is where you're going to find a lot of the features that are more unique to Olympus cameras. I'm going to demonstrate a few of them to you. Starting with bracketing. Now of course all cameras offer bracketing. But Olympus gives you auto exposure, white balance, flash and ISO bracketing. ISO bracketing is like AE bracketing but it allows you to keep the shutter speed and the aperture locked and adjust the ISO to get the exposures that you want. Then we have art filter bracketing. Now as you'll recall there is no art filter position on the modal. It is a professional camera. But the art filters are still in here. You can can access them via the picture styles menu or via this bracketing option you can choose to fire off as many as you like in a burst. 
at the end of the bracketing menu, we have focus bracketing and the EM1X offers two types of bracketing. We have standard bracketing where you can have up to 999 frames. The idea being that the camera adjusts the focus very slightly front or back between each of these frames and then you stack them in software later like Photoshop or Helicon Focus and you achieve a larger depth of field without having to close down the aperture and suffer from diffraction. However, you can also do focus stacking in camera. I'm going to show you how that works. Now, this was available on the previous EM1s, but only up to eight frames. Now we have up to 15 frames. I'm just going to change this focusing differential here. As always, it's a case of experimenting with uh, this mode because, you know, you're going to have to adjust it depending on which lens you're using. Speaking of lenses, you do, if you want to do focus stacking in camera, you need to use one of the Olympus Pro lenses. I'm using the 40 to 150 here. So let's see what happens. So you can see it very quickly wrapped through uh, the focusing differential distances that I gave it. And it's now stacking them in camera. Don't expect this all to work first time. If I play back the image, you'll see that it's cropped it. It does that with the in-camera stacking. But the other images are here if you want to comp them later yourself. But here is the result in camera. And yeah, it does need a bit of work. But you can see that more of these wings are in focus than before. Definitely because I'm shooting this particular shot at 150 millimeter. So the depth of field is already very, very shallow. So that's pretty handy to have that feature in camera. But there's more. We also have in camera HDR. We have multiple exposures. And fairly unique to the Olympus system is Keystone Compensation. This mode lets you correct for geometry in camera. It's very handy for straightening out converging lines when you're pointing up at tall buildings. I'll show you how that works. So I'll activate that, go back to my live view, and now I can use the front dial to adjust the geometry in the horizontal direction. And then much more usefully, if you're looking up at buildings, I can use the rear dial to adjust the geometry in this direction. And when you get the setting you want, you just take the picture and it does all that correction in camera. Now, of course, that's something you can very easily do in post-processing afterwards, but the whole point of this is that you can do it in camera. There is no need to do it in post. Further down the menu, we have the anti-shock settings. This allows you to program in a delay to avoid for shutter shock, although I didn't actually experience that on this camera. Next up, the high-res shot. Now, Olympus was one of the first companies to pioneer this, and it exploits the built-in sensor shift stabilization to move the sensor in tiny increments in different directions while taking multiple photos. These are then composited together into a single image, which is high resolution and also eliminates uh, the effects of the Bayer Color Filter Array. Now, this was already present on the earlier EM1 Mark II, but what's new here is that Olympus have added a handheld mode. This actually lets you take these uh, high resolution uh, composite images handheld. But I'm just going to show you the tripod option here, first of all, to show you the kind of processing time that you're dealing with. So once we have that selected, you need to take it, it here from the drive mode. There we have the high res shot mode. And now it took eight pictures there and it's now gluing them all together into a single image. If I play back that image, we can see that there is lots of nice detail in there. Now, if I go for the handheld version of this mode, see how this differs. So I am actually going to pick up the camera while I do this. So it is handheld. I'll put it back down again. Now, when you're doing it handheld, I believe it takes 16 frames to compensate for ones where you might have been wobbling a bit. And the processing time is also a bit longer, as you can see. But you end up, again, with another high resolution result. Let me zoom in on this one. You can see that looks pretty good. And it also works quite well with subjects that are moving, maybe like a tree waving in the wind or a bird that's flying past in the sky. Sometimes works better than other times. So now I'm going to show you some examples of that high res shot mode in practice. OK, let's start with a studio resolution chart. And on the left is a magnified view of the single 20 megapixel frame. And on the right, the 50 megapixel composite version. 
With this kind of subject, the difference is clear with a high res mode delivering a genuine and significant benefit. But what about real life situations? Here's a bunch of sample images I took using the normal and handheld high res modes, starting with the full image, then magnifying the normal 20 megapixel version on the left and the 50 megapixel composite high res version on the right. Like its predecessors, the success in real life situations can vary considerably depending on the subject, your lens, the settings and your technique. Sometimes there would be a dramatic difference in detail on the high res version, but at other times there didn't appear to be anything between them. Despite Olympus claiming to better handle elements of the frame that are in motion, there can still be some undesirable artifacts, particularly on shots including people, birds or cars in motion, or simply trees or foliage gently swaying in the breeze. On the plus side, the new handheld mode certainly appears to work, allowing you to capture potentially high resolution images without a tripod. But since the subjects which benefit the most are studio, archive or architecture, you'll probably have a tripod on hand anyway. And now returning back to the menus, let's have a look at this last option, which is new to the EM1X, Live ND Shooting. Now, I'm into long exposure photography, but it does involve carrying around a filter system with you in order to soak up all of that spare light that you don't want to achieve those longer exposures. However, the Olympus EM1X can now simulate it in camera. And there's five different options here. You can go for a one stop, two stop, three stop, four stop, or five stop ND filter. And it will give a kind of simulation on screen on how this looks, although it is really slowed down and it does make you feel a little bit nauseous. So don't, don't worry too much about about that. But how does it work in practice? Well, to find out, I headed down to Brighton Seafront and I took a number of shots of the rolling sea using the ND simulation and also real life NDs. Here's how they looked. To start off, here's a normal exposure of a seascape without any ND filter, digital or physical. It's at 200th of a second. Next, here's the mildest live ND setting of ND2 or one stop, which used a shutter speed of 30th of a second. Note, you need to be in manual or shutter priority modes to use the live ND feature. It'll be greyed out in any other exposure mode. Now you're looking at live ND4 or two stops, which used a shutter speed of 15th of a second. Next, live ND8 or three stops, which used a shutter speed of an eighth of a second. Now for live ND16, or four stops, which used a shutter speed of a quarter of a second. And finally, the strongest setting, live ND32, or five stops, which used a shutter speed of half a second. There's definitely some blurring coming in here, but how does it compare to an actual physical ND filter under the same conditions? Here's the result with a three stop Lee ND filter, which as you can see has introduced a mild color cast, but look beyond it to the motion and blurring. With the sensitivity reduced to 64 ISO, I was able to deploy a shutter speed of 0.8 seconds, a fraction longer than the Live ND 32's half second, but there's visibly greater blurring and smoothing on the surface. Compare it again to the Live ND 8 setting on the left here, which simulates the same three stops, but using a quicker 1 8th of a second exposure. In this example, I'd say the physical filter on the right is doing a better job at smoothing the surface and blurring the splashes, but the Live ND simulation, especially at its strongest setting, is still capable of delivering a useful alternative, especially since it's hassle-free. Seascape photographers will probably stick with physical filters, but for an easy blurring effect on faster motion, like waterfalls, the Live ND mode can be very convenient. When you enter the menu system, you see that there's two pages devoted to shooting options, one to video options, one for playback, one for setup, and in a new addition to the EM1X, a very welcome My Menu page, which lets you custom build your own menu. This is really useful. However, there's one that I've not shown you yet. The elephant in the room is the custom menu, the area which intimidates first time and indeed seasoned. Olympus owners simply because of the sheer number of things that you can set up and customize here But it is well worth spending some time in here because you will find a ton of settings that will really let you optimize Or configure the way that you use this camera and it's going to delve into a couple of them Just to show you some of the things that you can do on the second page here under target mode settings We can see that there's four different options here where I can actually build my own custom AF zones, which is a nice new feature on the EM1X. 
not dissimilar to the way it worked on the latest Panasonic Lumix cameras. It lets you really define your own custom shapes for uh, AF zones. And then these can then be added to the AF zone menu. So you can just pull them up as normal. Moving on, let's have a look at C lock settings. Now you'll notice here on the EM1X, there is a C lock option here. This allows you, if I put it up to lock, I can, I can lock all of the controls on the portrait grip, but why lock all of them when I could customize exactly what buttons and dials I want to work or not to work when I, when I have it set to C lock. So Olympus really thinking about the way you're gonna use this. Here we can totally customize the drive modes. Uh, we've got separate settings for continuous low, which is with continuous autofocus and continuous high, which is with single AF. And within here, there's three options, depending on whether you're configuring the mechanical shutter, the electronic shutter, or the pro capture mode. And within each of these, you can set the maximum speed. You can put, set a frame limit. You can do even more with Pro Capture here because you can set the number of frames that are captured pre-burst and after you fully pressed the shutter release down. So again, well worth looking into that. Now moving on, I'm going to try and find a setting for you here, which is one of my favorites. Here it is, the bulb timer. Now I'm really into long exposure photography and, and as with all long exposure photographs, the challenge is how easily can you deploy exposures longer than 30 or 60 seconds. And the way Olympus does it is with a bulb timer. You set the top mode dial to bulb and then you can actually set a time at which you would like, if you want, like the shutter to just close by itself automatically. So here we can set it to close by itself after one minute, two minutes, four minutes, all the way up to half an hour. So whatever you select there, the bulb timer will automatically close the shutter after that. So that makes long exposure photography really, really easy. And like other Olympus cameras, there is a live bulb and a live time option, which actually lets you take peaks at the image as it's recording, either every half second, second, two seconds, and so on. These details down here tell you how many peaks you can take at the image, uh, because the more often that you peek at the image, noise is gradually introduced. So you don't want to do too many of these, but it actually shows the image building up and the histogram uh, building as well. So you can see how that long exposure is getting on. That is a pretty unique feature, which uh, only Olympus offers. It's really, really nice. And then down here, we can find at the end some options for the various field sensors in this camera. It has a built-in hardware GPS and it also can record the elevation and the temperature and you can also start recording logs if you like and these can be synchronized with the OI Track software, the app that's running on your phone that can plot everything about your photographic journey that day. The EM1X is equipped with Wi-Fi and now Bluetooth 2, allowing you to easily connect and wirelessly remote control it with your smartphone. I use the Android version of OI Share to remotely shoot and the app lets you tap to refocus stills, change exposure mode, adjust shooting settings and trigger photos or videos, although sadly you can't tap to focus when you're filming video. It's also easy to browse thumbnails of images on the card and copy across the shots you want. Meanwhile, the OI Track app can import logs recorded by the camera's field recorders, graphically displaying your route and elevation change, although if you'd also like to see the photos you shot during the trip, you'll need to manually copy these over as well. Olympus now also supplies the updated workspace software for image browsing, management and manipulation. You can also see data from the field recorders at the top and bottom of the EXIF panel on the right hand side. Now for a selection of images I shot with the EM1X using a variety of lenses. Now the body that I used was described as being initial production, so it's not final, 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 but it is evaluable in terms of quality. And in terms of quality, there's no real big surprises here since the sensor is the same as the EM1 Mark II before it. But like that model, Olympus makes the most of the data. Now everyone talks about Fujifilm's colors, but I think the Olympus color science is right up there too, delivering very attractive and natural looking results out of camera. Although you may want to tone down the occasionally over-enthusiastic sharpening a bit. As always, the smaller sensor inevitably suffers at high sensitivities and I'd recommend trying to keep it below 1600 ISO for the best results. 
But remember, if you're shooting static subjects or actually want to see motion blur in your pictures, then the EM1X's amazing image stabilization will let you handhold at ridiculously slow shutter speeds. So much so, I rarely find myself needing to shoot above the base sensitivity of 200 ISO unless I needed a fast shutter to freeze action in low light. And that's the decision you need to make, and it's a personal one. If you regularly need to use sensitivities above 3200 ISO to freeze action in low light and you want the cleanest results, then I'd recommend a camera with a bigger sensor. But if you can make the stabilization and the other unique features of the Olympus system work for you, then shooting with the EM1X and indeed other Olympus cameras can be extremely liberating. Before moving on, what sort of difference does a full frame sensor make to high ISO quality anyway? To find out, I shot this scene with the EM1X and Sony A9 at each of their sensitivities and cropped the area indicated by the red rectangle for closer examination. The EM1X crops are on the left and the A9 crops on the right. The first things you notice are the small resolution advantage of the Sony sensor at 24 megapixels and also their respective approach to white balance, sharpening and colour processing. As the sensitivities increase though, the Sony inevitably takes the lead, as you'd expect with a sensor sporting roughly four times the surface area. So again, you need to ask yourself very carefully, how often do you shoot at high ISOs? How good do you need the result to look? And can you exploit any of the Olympus tech to stick to the lower sensitivities? Moving on to video, the EM1X unsurprisingly performs similarly to the EM1 Mark II. As such, you can film 1080, or 4K in 16x9 or slightly wider cinema ratios, but sadly it won't film 4K above 30p, which is a shame for a high-end camera in 2019, and also disappointing since the EM1X can actually capture 60 frames per second bursts at 20 megapixel resolution and now has double the processing muscle of the EM1 Mark II. To compare the video modes, here's a scene I filmed with a 17mm lens in 1080 50p where there's no crop horizontally. 1080 up to 120p for slow motion is available, but with a crop as you can see here. Now for 4K resolution where there's no horizontal crop at any frame rate. And here's Cinema 4K where the field is trimmed a little vertically for the wider aspect ratio. Cinema 4K is however only available at 24p. New to the EM1X is OM Log for grading later. This is how it looks in 4K. And now this is how it looks with the previous flat profile. You can effectively stabilize footage with the sensor shift system alone with no cropping of the horizontal field of view. But if you want more stabilization, MIS mode one applies additional digital stabilization with a small crop as you can see here. The touchscreen and phase detect autofocus system allows you to make smooth focus pulls by tapping the screen. I filmed this with the 17 millimeter at f1.8. Throw great stabilization into the equation and you have a camera you can casually film with and enjoy stable footage that also refocuses confidently. This was filmed with the 17mm at f1.8 and with sensor stabilization only. If you're panning, you can find the stabilization catching up with itself, but the jumping effect can be reduced by turning down the IS sensitivity as I've done here. I was actually filming with a 300mm lens here for a 600mm equivalent field of view. Conversely, if you're trying to keep the composition mostly static, you can increase the IBIS sensitivity for eerily stable results. I handheld this with a 40 to 150 at 150mm for a 300mm equivalent field of view, and this is using sensor shift stabilization only. When you stop moving, so does the picture. Even if you're wobbling, it's just incredibly stable. You can also adjust the sensitivity of the continuous autofocus system and you'll need to do that to keep up with faster subjects like this clip of Alexander approaching on his bike. Like most cameras there's some visible skewing if you swing the camera around but as I mentioned earlier the Olympus sensor is better behaved than many and if you're panning gently you should enjoy mostly upright verticals. Now for some examples of the 1080-120p mode, which, as I mentioned earlier, captures video with a small crop and without sound or continuous autofocus. Footage is also automatically interpreted in camera to a desired frame rate. I chose 25p here to match my timeline, and this has resulted in a 4.8 times slowdown. And now for one final video test, and with its flip screen and great stabilization, I just had to try out the EM1X for vlogging, although I suspect no one else will. Hello, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is a quick vlogging test with the Olympus OMD EM1X. Not your first choice for vlogging, perhaps, 
because it's a $3,000 specialty sports and wildlife camera, but it is actually rather good and it does give me an opportunity to demonstrate Olympus's amazing image stabilization, more about which in just a moment. So I'm filming this in 4K at 25p. This camera can film 4K up to 30p, sadly no 50 or 60p on this model yet. It'll do 1080 at up to 120p for slow motion. And the things that make it good for vlogging is that it has a screen that can flip out to the side and face forward. It has a sensor covered with phase detect autofocus points, which coupled with pretty good face detection means that it should be keeping me nice and focused on the frame. Speaking of which, I'm using the Olympus 17mm f1.8 lens here. At f1.8, because it's getting quite dim here. I'm at a 50th of a second. Maybe a little bit tight this lens, but I wanted to show how well this camera worked with an unstabilized lens. Now, if you fit this camera with one of Olympus's Sync IS lenses, like the 12 to 100, it will achieve, according to them, up to seven and a half stops of compensation. That is the world's greatest stabilization at the moment. Fit an unstabilized lens, like this one, and you should still get six to seven stops. Now, if you're filming movies, you can also apply additional digital stabilization, but I'm not doing that here. This is just sensor shift, and you can see it's eerily good, isn't it? I'm not using a tripod, I'm not using a handle or a holder. I'm shaking quite a lot as normal because I've not had my coffee yet today. But the, it's so smooth, this system. And this is the really key selling point of the Olympus cameras, is that they let you film this sort of thing without a gimbal or without any kind of cage or setup time. You really are running and gunning, which is really nice. In terms of audio, I apologize for any construction noise you can hear in the background. I'm using the internal microphones on the camera, but there is of course a microphone input and you can mount a mic on the top without blocking the screen. Take that, Sony. And it also has a headphone jack. So I mean, it is fully equipped. It is a professional camera. No one is really probably gonna use this for vlogging, but I wanted to show you what it looked like anyway. The Olympus OMD EM1X is a beefed up EM1 Mark II repackaging its 20 megapixel sensor, 4K movies and 18 frames per second burst into a larger and tougher body with an integrated portrait grip, twin batteries, field sensors, improved autofocus tracking, USB power and even better built-in stabilization than before. The result is a camera that can confidently handle action and wildlife shooting while shrugging off cold, wet or dusty environments. The stabilization is remarkably good, letting me handhold 8 second exposures or film at 600mm without any visible wobbles. Indeed, the EM1X is all about achieving the kind of results handheld that would normally require lugging around a tripod or gimbal, which coupled with the mobility of a smaller sensor system makes for a more portable kit that you'd be happier to drag across a sports field or especially into the backcountry. But there's no 4K at 60p, the viewfinder is relatively low res, and crucially, the quality and many of its unique features are already available, albeit in a slightly downgraded form, in the EM1 Mark II at almost half the price. Unless we forget, the EM1 Mark II itself occupies a fiercely competitive category, with stiff competition from multiple rivals sporting decent action credentials and often larger sensors. Models like the Lumix G9, Nikon D500, Fujifilm X-T3 and Sony A7 III. Then at the high end, the EM1X may be comfortably cheaper than pro bodies from Canon, Nikon and Sony, but they all feature much larger full-frame sensors, which deliver cleaner results at the kind of high ISOs that sports and wildlife shooters often need to deploy. And while the Olympus feature set makes the Pro DSLRs look old fashioned, Sony's A9 is a much tougher, more modern rival, costing only one third more. So I can't help but think those who buy into the Olympus mobility message and exploit the unique feature set will find it hard to make the price leap from the EM1 Mark II. And those who want to build a higher end sports system with better low light capabilities will probably reach further and invest in a Sony A9. But sometimes you have to stop overanalyzing. Yes, the EM1X is a specialist body with a correspondingly limited audience, and there's no getting away from the fact it's the largest, heaviest, and most expensive Micro Four Thirds camera to date. But it's a camera I still enjoyed shooting with immensely. It looks and feels great, it's tougher than anything at the price, and it delivers good results backed up by some truly unique and industry-leading tech.
I've gone into much more detail comparing it against rival options and discussing the pros and cons of a small sensor in my EM1X review at Cameralabs.com. So if you'd like to delve deeper into which system will be best for you, I'll see you there. If you found this review useful, please give me a like and if you haven't already subscribed, please give me a follow and click the notification bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of my videos. And if you really, really like it, you can support my work by checking prices or treating me to a coffee using the links below. Cheers. If you're into photography without post-processing, also check out my in-camera book which tells the story behind 100 of my favourite travel photos, all JPEGs out of camera with no Photoshop or Lightroom. You can also find me on Instagram and Twitter at Camera Labs. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye bye.